sometimes you have to take a few steps back to move forward. I don't know, they say the truth will set you free. The, the truth of, of our family's story. My name is Sarah, and my name is Cecilia. I was abducted by my American father when I was four years old, and hidden from my Norwegian mother for 14 years. I really wanted to go back to the place that I was born with my mother because there's something about going there that made me feel so real. So this is where I took my first breath, like yes. you mm -hmm. just said. And you were, for me, <laughs> the most wonderful baby in the world. Aww. <laughs> I was 27 when I met Herbert, and uh, he was 11 years older than me. We got married the 1st of February, 1969, and we moved um, to Denmark. He got a job there, and uh, Cecilia was born the 11th of February, 1970. My father was a, an educated, professional person with a good deal of intelligence and a good deal of ability to, to live a normal life. But that's not what he really, what he really pursued. I'm the half-brother of Sarah. We share a father, um, but we have different mothers. My father must have had a good deal of difficulty in his life for a variety of reasons at managing relationships. I told him that we, we uh, should end our marriage and I'll um, go back to, to Oslo and uh, uh, get uh, a job. My father stayed in Copenhagen but came to Oslo to see me whenever he was able to. My mother warmly supported our father-daughter relationship one day in April of 1974, when I was four years old, my father came for one of his visits, and the plan was that he would take me to the Vigeland Park, which is a sculpture park here in Oslo. When the time went by, um, I expected them back two o'clock. It was two, uh, two and a half, and I, I took my coat, I could meet them at the tram station, but there were none. 3, 3.30, 7.30, I went to the police. And then I, I think I said to the policeman that, can he, have taken her to another country, to the United States. He instead took me to the airport and we boarded, boarded a flight to um, New York. I remember the first days in New York, I remember impressions of, of the big city, lots of cars beeping, skyscrapers, and just being completely overwhelmed by it all. Heading towards Brooklyn to the place that I was abducted to feels a bit like a betrayal of my mother, in a way, because I love Brooklyn. I have a lot of wonderful memories there. It's a bittersweet 
journey back. This is where it all kind of began. And, um, you know, the craziness of uh, life on the run and um, building a new identity and shutting my mother completely out of that life. It makes a lot of sense that this is where my father chose to go, be, to, to Lubavitch, because they are a group that welcomes sort of transient or, uh, you know, wayward Jews. My father clearly took advantage of this and presented himself as, as a wayward Jew with a young daughter that needed help, needed a place to come to. I started having nightmares at night. I, I'd wake up and think that there were lions and tigers in the room. I was, became a really scared child. I was terrified all the time. And I started to forget what my mother looked like. I remember trying to picture her in my head and I, I couldn't remember her face anymore. My name was changed several times as a child. I was a boy for a little while, put on and off a lot of different identities to avoid being tracked. I don't really remember clearly when I was given my new name or another name, which was Sarah. I always knew that my name used to be Cecilia, but that now it was going to be Sarah. And that, I guess that symbolized for me um, that was, that was all about my new life and the person that I was becoming. Uh, I'd like to show you the pictures. First, the pictures uh, your father sent me. So I looked at them and cried. For me, the trauma was um, in what it did to me, you know, all those years of running, of, of being told all sorts of crazy things um, about my mother, about, you know, and dealing with my mother's anger and, and deep pain at what my father had done and at how difficult searching for me was. For me, it was kind of a cumulative thing that built up. When I was six years old, my mother found, found my father and I with the help of some detectives and Interpol, the international police. A court date was set. I could feel that she was uh, brainwashed. She was a, a different child. I remember vaguely my father talking to me a lot about what might happen and that um, it was that my mother wanted to take me away. I was stiff as a, as a board by the time we went to the courthouse and I was led into a room where my mother was sitting. You know, she was showing me pictures of me. I, I recognized me in those pictures under a Christmas tree or, or birthdays or you know, being held by all these strangers and kissed. And I felt so completely alienated, so, so different from that little kid in that picture. I mean, I was still a little kid, but it was a whole different person to me. The judge in New York ordered that I was to go to Norway with my mother for the summer and be returned to New York in September for a final decision of custody to be determined then. My father was not happy with this. One evening during the court case, my father and I went out to the little car that we had and painted it. We headed out of New York. We were the wanderers from when I was the age of six uh, until I was 16. We'd be somewhere and I'd think, okay, I guess we're here for a while. And suddenly in the middle of the night, we, we have to leave. She's on our trail. Um, you know, we, we have to go. I didn't go to school very much at all and, and would, went to school a little bit here and there. I lived a parallel life. Um, I had my own private 
struggle and war. And, and on the other side, I had to, to uh, work like a normal person. So, so there were two different parts of me. One of the letters that my father wrote while he was with Sarah and on the run with Sarah um, was written in 1977. It was, um, he says, Dear Albert, my little girl Sarah and I often talk about you and your brothers. Be well and know that you are in my prayers. For good health. And, um, and good mazel. We will hope you have a good Hanukkah and that your life is full with light. Sincerely, Herschel. He signed it Herschel, you know, he never accepted the fact that he was my dad. <laughs> I met my dad's sister when I was about 11 or 12 years old. My father and I would, would, would pop these surprise visits on them because he didn't trust his own family either. So we'd just kind of pop in, you know, park the car, 20 blocks away, put on, put hats on, our, on ourselves and, and pop in for an hour, totally unannounced, and like, and leave in a real hurry. And I remember having like two minutes alone with one of my aunts and she said, you know, I met your mother a few years ago and she's a beautiful woman and she loves you very much and she misses you so much and it would be wonderful for her and for you, for you guys to, to meet and be together. Before I had a chance to answer anything, my father came and he said, you know, what are you, what are you talking to her about? And, you know, and, and, and we just left. He had some feeling, I guess, that we were talking about her, about something that he didn't approve of. I remember people telling me, um, you know, you're so serious. You're such a serious little kid. Why, aren't, why are you so serious? Why don't you laugh and play? And you know, why aren't you more like other kids? And, and I always felt so bad, so ashamed and so guilty that I, I said, no, I'm, I'm not... I'm not serious. I, I didn't even really know what that meant. I'm going to take uh, Cecilia to the kindergarten she, she went to be, before she was abducted uh, now. And it's quite emotional for me. So here it were. is. Yeah. Wow. And, and uh, it was in the, the tall house. Uh, but here you were. Wow. Uh, and, uh, and look at all these children playing happily. Yeah. It's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that was me once. I like to read a poem to you. Um, I wrote it many, many years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was to you. And I didn't know where you were. Mm. And it goes like this. En som het, en som het frid, musik, koraller, en som het farger, blomsterdufter, en som het alt. Og jeg hadde was left, I was left with en som het loneliness. Yes, it's beautiful. You were a special child, you know. I could, I'm, I'm a teacher, so I know I could compare. <laughs> <laughs> You're not biased at all, are you? <laughs> Terrible thing to say. It's wonderful, I love it. The photograph that that I took of Sarah was taken near a bus station in Washington, D.C., where Sarah was very, very happy to see me. I think I wanted to help her, and um, but I, I didn't know how to do it. I left my father when I was 16. I, I didn't want to travel around anymore. I couldn't do it anymore. I went to stay by a family. And so one day my father 
called and he said, I'll be coming to pick you up tomorrow. And I said, no, you won't. Um, I'm not coming. He said, oh, I always knew you would reject me just like your brothers did. You used to be my sunshine. You're not my sunshine anymore. I felt so very alone when I, you know, told him I'm not coming with him. He was the only security I had. It was a really tough time. I had to find myself. I called my mother for the first time when I was 17. You know, as, as I was dialing the number, I, f I nearly fainted. It was such an intense thing to do. I was really scared. And I, I just said, you know, hello, you know, and she said, hello. I said, hello, this is your daughter. You know, and then I said, how are you? And, uh, you know, she said, and, and how are you? You know, are you okay? And, um, and it was like, whew, you know, so intense that I, I, I almost wanted to just hang up right away. I said, oh, you know, maybe we should see each other soon, maybe, maybe next summer or in the summer. That was a few months away. And the next time I called, my mother had booked a ticket. And I remember feeling like, whoa, I don't know if I'm ready for this. This is, this is a little too much. It was really difficult for her to relate to me. We did this dance that was really sort of trying to, you know, sort of step on eggshells around each other and protect each other. And at the same time, we were hurting each other so much by doing that. It was, neither of us knew how to navigate the situation. So those were tough years. It was really hard to connect. I, de I had developed severe anorexia a really bad eating disorder that was sort of a manifestation of all the turmoil that I was that was going on inside me and I crashed. It, I, it wasn't until the age of 30 that I could have a real relationship with a man, with a partner. I didn't, I just, I, I, I could, I didn't, I couldn't connect with someone, someone in that way. I couldn't, I, I couldn't trust enough almost. It, I was, I was so wounded. I mean, it took years of going through very serious depressions and some hospitalizations and some serious acting out in my 20s of, you know, getting my life together. I'm waiting for a flight to Tel Aviv. My father moved to Israel from New York several years ago. I have had long conversations with my father in the past week in planning this trip which is something I never thought I would have again with him. After choosing about 20 years ago now to cut him out of my life so that I could move forward. I'm going to see my father soon. I'm looking forward to seeing him. I'm in a place of forgiveness. I don't want to carry a grudge anymore. What you're doing is just stirring it up. He looks so old, and, and I think what struck me is that he's just a weak little man that made poor decisions. Spoke with her yesterday. She said, tell your father that we, no matter what has happened, we have a beautiful daughter together she said. So she wanted me to tell you that. He has some understanding that he did something wrong and that most people might judge him poorly for what he did. I'm kind of dreading seeing him this morning. I'm not sure what it'll be like. It's almost as if he's begging for the world to understand him and to understand and accept what he did. What I see with, after these days here is a very sad person, a lonely person, a person with regret, with a very chaotic inner life, very torn about what he did, about the consequences, about his life now. This is where he lives, this tiny little dirty little place. 
The smell is pretty bad and he's not doing very well at all. I'm full of emotion and sadness for everything that he's put himself through and put us through. I don't know, I don't know if this would be where he envisioned himself as a young, as a young person at all. Um, and when I see that picture of him, um, I see a really different person there who must have felt there was a bright future for him. 71 year, and you have to have this story to tell people about your life. That's not, it's, it's very hard and painful. I'd like to have at least the illusion of safety and belonging and security, you know, and I don't, I don't have that. Hello, Dad. He is, he's sitting on my lap. He's taking a day off from his kindergarten because he, he didn't sleep so well. So he's, he, he's really tired. Our story is pretty complex, isn't it? In all families, things can get com complex. You're right. That's true. Human relationships are not that easy. I've thought of myself as having been a success story for a very long time, or me and my mother being a success story. And in many ways we are, but the past has not become any smaller with time. It's almost become larger as my mother faces her older years and has to deal with the fact that she has never moved on that her identity is, in my view, very much wrapped up in being the victim of parental child abduction. For me, I'm left with devastating bouts of depression and anxiety, insomnia, and it's hard to admit that because I like to pretend that I'm doing fine. This is my house, and now it feels like a home. It's taken a long time, to feel at home here. And this is something I've yearned for forever, to be settled, to have a sense of belonging. I don't think I can ever close the door on the past, but I can make peace with it in a, in a whole different way than I ever thought that I could. Closing little doors, it was, it is, and it always will be what happened, and it will always affect me to some extent, but it doesn't have to take over anymore. I feel in control of my story. Like, I, I understand it better. I understand myself better. I understand both of my parents better on, on the path towards healing. Vigalan Park feels like the place I disappeared from. There's a bittersweetness. I'm glad that I'm there. I'm glad I'm able to visit it today and um, reclaim it. There always will be some ambiguity in, in this story. I can't put it all in a neat little box. And it's mine, it's ours. It is what it is. <laughs>